Okay, this is an unbelievable question. It is extremely controversial. Uh, my answer will also be a drop controversial. The question is as follows. As the singles over age 30, do you believe there is a shidduch crisis? Meaning, is there a shidduch crisis for singles over age 30? How would you define what that crisis is? What can and should the Jewish community do to help older singles? Do you think a shul should try to help by organizing singles events for these older singles? Or is it better to have events not targeted solely to singles so that singles expand their social networks and perhaps get set up by new friends? Okay, that's the question. And there's a lot, there's a lot to say about this, but we have very limited time, so let's see what we can squeeze in. From a Torah perspective, a crisis is not defined by numbers. When a certain number of people are having a hard time, then it's called a crisis. That's not a Torah view. Crisis is not a quantitative term. It's a qualitative one. When a man or woman wants to get married, and that one man or that one woman is experiencing agony because he or she is alone, that constitutes a crisis. So to answer your question simply, is there a shit of crisis, meaning is there a man or a woman out there in pain because they aren't married? And the answer is obviously yes, without a question. There is at least one or two people out there, perhaps more, who are in agony. So yes, there's a crisis. But I'm not going to say you need a thousand people to have a crisis. We aren't a mass movement, as I've said so many times. Every single Jew's suffering is a crisis. Now, if you want to understand how that man or woman can save himself or herself from the crisis, it does help to step back and look at numbers just to try to understand how these individuals could get themselves out of trouble. So let's start with numbers that have nothing to do with the Jewish community. Let's start with the biggest numbers. By the way, obviously, why am I doing this? Because we would be very naive to think that orthodoxy seals us off in some way from everything happening around us. Orthodox Jews live in a permeable bubble. And even the most unassimilated of us are very influenced by our environment. So what's happening right outside the bubble that's leaking in? So this is fairly recent research. There was a September 2017 Pew report about Americans that said as follows. Here's three numbers to consider. First number. 72% of U.S. adults were married in 1960. 72% of U.S. adults were married in the year 1960. And only 50% of U.S. adults are married as of 2016. So that's a drop of about 30%. Americans are getting married a lot less. Point number two, number number two. The median age for first marriage in 1960 was 20.4 years old for women and 22.5 years old for men. Once again, the median age, that means half the people were above, half the people were below. The median age for first marriage in 1960 was 20.4 years old for women, 22.5 years old for men. And in 2016, it was 27.4 years old for women and 29.5 years old for men. Meaning that in 2016, men and women were getting married about seven years later than they were in 1960. That also means that more than half of American men and women today 
aren't marrying until close to age 30. More than half. So that's what's happening right outside the bubble. We don't expect 25, 28, 29 year olds to be married. More than half aren't married until around age 30. Okay, the third number. Among adults who have never been married, this is shocking. These are people who have never been married, Americans. 58, only 58% say they would still like to get married someday. 58% of Americans who are not married say, someday I would like to get married. 27% aren't sure if they ever want to get married. And 14% say they're sure they never want to get married. So you're talking about fully 41% of Americans or just under half of never married Americans at this moment don't want to get married or don't know if they ever want to get married. Okay, now, that number is crucial for understanding what's happening in our community, especially that number. All three numbers are important, but especially that last one. If a person doesn't know if they want to get married, there's a 99.9% .9 chance they're not going to get married, and if they do get married, there's a 100% chance they're going to have conflict in their marriage. I... I was involved in a case when I was working at Neve Yerushalayim. I was involved in a case of a woman who had dated for 10 years. And she, she came into the office of one of the, the, the real sages who used to work at Neve Yerushalayim Seminary, Rabbi Tchaikovsky. And, and, and she said to him, I've been dating for 10 years. I can't take it anymore. And she, she was bawling. She was crying with pain. And Rabbi Tchaikovsky interrupted her and said, young lady, tell me something. She looked up at him and he said, do you really want to get married right now? And she choked down her tears, wiped her face, and said to him, actually, no. And he said, when you want to get married, you will get married. A year later, she came back again, and she told us that she had just decided she wanted to get married, and wonder of wonders, she met the guy. <laughs> exactly what Tchaikovsky said. So the first step in resolving the crisis is, how influenced are you by the environment around you? Maybe you don't want to get married. Maybe that's not a goal of yours right now. Work on that. And how do you do that? So. There's different approaches. First of all, we as parents want to raise kids who want to get married. And in order to raise kids who want to get married, what we can do for them is present them with a wonderful marriage. And, and the truth is, as Orthodox Jews, we have some advantage, at least the statistics seem to say so. There was a, a Dr. Yitzhak Schechter, who in an interview with Jewish Action, recently said that only about 10% of Orthodox Jewish marriages end in divorce, compared to 48% in the general population. So obviously, it, the Jews are doing pretty well. Now, I'll be the first to admit, it takes a lot of marital strife to push a marriage over the edge and actually cause a divorce. So we're not saying that 90% of Jewish marriages are happy, because only 10% divorce rate. There can be a lot of unhappiness before something actually explodes into a divorce. But if the rates of divorce are lower in the Jewish world, then it's possible, I'll even go so far, so far as to say from my personal experience, it's probable that rates of happiness in marriage are also a little bit higher in the Jewish community, in the Orthodox community, than they are in the general population where there's 48% divorce. So thank God Torah works. But if you want to help your kids want to get married, show them a great marriage. And look, there's lots of reasons to try to have a great marriage, but here's one more. So as parents, stick that in your, in your motiva motivational box. Okay, now what happens if I'm the man or the woman who is having trouble wanting to get married? I wasn't necessarily provided with an attractive model of marriage when I was growing up. Let's say that's the case. 
uh, if I grew up in a home where there was divorce or there was, there, were, there was constant fighting, then how do I save myself? How do I get myself to, to the point where I want to get married? And the answer is, uh, I can learn about what an ideal Torah marriage looks like. It's very attractive. And I can start working on my mitos. I can work on my character. I mean, realize that character is the key to happiness in marriage. The more of a giver I am, the more that I care about taking care of the other, then the happier my marriage is going to be. Um, and of course, communication is important. There's lots of key character traits that I have to work on. And if I work on those, then my marriage will be better. So if I wasn't presented with a great marriage as a kid, now as an adult, I can start learning about what a great marriage looks like, practicing right, proper interaction with other people, practicing good, good dating, right, interacting with people properly on, when, I, when I do date, and I can work on my character. Um, and there's so many ways to work on character. The, 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 the Torah world offers us Musr Svarim, books of Musr books. We have Midos Shirim, uh, you know, special classes that just focus on characters development. We have Musr Vadim, the, the international organization of Musr, which I founded 25 years ago, uh, has brought thousands of people uh, through Midos uh, development seminars. So there's lots and lots of places where an Orthodox Jew could go to work on themselves and, and make themselves into the sort of person who's going to be really happy in marriage. Uh, but of course, being ready to get married and having good character isn't enough. You still need to meet the guy or meet the girl. And we all know that paid professional shadchanim cannot be relied upon exclusively today. There are only a handful of people out there that are doing this professionally. Uh, there's not enough of them. And unfortunately, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes those who pay the most can rise to the top of the list, which means if I can't pay the most, I might have trouble meeting people. Uh, and therefore, what you may want to do is rely on ordinary friends and family. Uh, friends and family can do a lot, and they can introduce you to a lot of people. If we democratize Shidduchim, if we take it out of just the hands of the professionals and take it upon ourselves to make the effort to introduce people to each other, then we could make the system far more effective and it would be much easier to meet the right people. So I recommend that every single Jew take it upon him or herself to try to introduce other Jews, single Jews, to each other. And we can make Shudachim even more accessible if we eliminate the middleman entirely. Meaning, wouldn't that be amazing if you didn't even need to depend on friends and family? How could you do that? Uh, one example by hosting single men and women at your Shabbos table every week, and by creating community events where all people are welcome, married, singles. You know, once upon a time, this was considered to be a breach of modesty. It was just inappropriate to have men and women at the same Shabbos table, or men and women, single men and women at the same event. But given the environment we live in today, people are in mixed environments already that are much less modest than these events. They're at the office, they're at the university, and there's probably much more good that is going to come from a from mixed Shabbos table or a from event than there is bad that's going to come from it. So therefore, uh, we would be very, very encouraging for, for, for the sort of events which allow single people to meet each other. Okay, I ran over a little bit tonight, but you asked great questions and I didn't want to stop. They're spectacular. Keep the questions coming. I, this has become one of the most precious hours in my life. So, so please continue to, to, to send in these questions. I'm going to try to keep pushing through them as fast as I can, try to keep up with you guys. And uh, I, I look forward to, to speaking with you, hopefully, in our, in our next upcoming session. I hope you enjoyed that recent answer from Rabbi Kellerman during one of our Q&A sessions for Inner Circle members. If you'd like to learn more about the Inner Circle program or if you'd like some new classes um, for free, just head over to Rabbi Kellerman's website. You can find it one of two ways. Either type in 
lawrencekelleman.com, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E-K-E-L-E-M-E-N.com, or just Google Rabbi Kellerman, K-E-L-E-M-E-N, um, and you'll find his site and put in your email address, and we'll send you a bunch of free videos and let you know about the Inner Circle program as well. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye.